Freedom HealthWorks is the direct primary care accelerator. We help doctors across the country start fresh in direct primary care. With Freedom HealthWorks, you work with a team, not a checklist. Visit freedomhealthworks.com and together we can achieve true freedom in direct care. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Healthcare Americana. I am your host, Christopher Habig. And today is our first episode of the Saving Grace of the Year 2021. But we're already seven days in, as most people will say, uh, by the time we record this podcast. And a lot of people are already regretting their free seven-day trial of 2021 coming off of 2020. But this episode is going to change all this. And so today we wanted to really tackle something that comes up a lot when we are looking at uh, physicians coming out of the residency or direct care practices, or even talking about employment scenarios. And that is all the, the, I'll call it the myriad number of legal complications that can arise from contracts, uh, employment, and what you can and can't do in the course of insurance, direct care, or Medicare-based practices. So to help me out with this conversation, we're welcoming uh, Isaac Willett, Oh, sorry, Ike. Do you want to go by Ike or Isaac? You can call me Ike. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here we go. So today we are welcoming Ike Willett and Steve Lokengard from Fagri, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time joining us here on Healthcare Americana. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate you having Thanks. us. Now we're going to dive right into it because the legal environment uh, dealing with the direct care world is something that is nebulous to say the least. And now coming off of a new administration, uh, taking office very, very soon, who knows what the future is going to hold for us. We've seen a little bit of opinions back and forth. But for this episode, what I really want to start is a physician's journey. And so they're going to medical school and they go to residency and then they get towards the end of residency and they get a lot of job offers, hopefully, you know, people are, are desiring them. We get questions a lot of, you know, what are in these job offers? What are these contracts? What can I push back on? What is not okay? What's going to, you know, potentially get me fired or get this agreement withdrawn? So that's where I want to start is what are some things that some early career physicians need to watch out for when it comes to anti-competitive uh, language or just really the employment contracts in general? Well, I, you know, I, I'll kick this one off and Steve, you feel free to jump in as you, uh, as you like. Um, you know, I think in a very, very, you know, kind of lawyerly way to you know, start this answer is, is um, the answer is kind of, it depends, right? Um, so, and one of the things that might depend on is in terms of how much negotiation latitude you have and things of that nature um, is who's the employer, right? Um, a large health system uh, um, that has a, you know, a well-developed form of employment agreement that they try to use for um, their doctors across the various specialties that they, you know, have, may have uh, employed doctors for, um, you know, likely will be less willing to negotiate on some on on the document kind of on a wholesale basis might be some things that kind of uh on the kind of some certain key points that they might uh, be willing to discuss but uh you know they uh, might not want to move um you know substantially off of uh this kind of form of employment agreement that they try to keep you know most of their doctors on on the other hand if you're joining a uh independent group um there could be you know uh, more latitude there um, and and I think um, I've you know I've seen independent physician groups um, you know agree to things you know, in order to recruit uh, new physicians or to you know help their ability to obtain talent um, you know that that shows you know a, a pretty substantial amount of flexibility. Um, you mentioned non competes. I mean that that certainly includes on the independent group side a willingness to negotiate on non competes, whether it's negotiating. Um, the length or um, geographic scope um, over which the non-compete applies or willingness to maybe contemplate specific exceptions to non-competes. Um, I, I think that's a harder sell with a health system, um, but um, it's something that I would encourage a physician to have open dialogue with, um, uh, with any employer that they're thinking about uh, joining. 
you know, make sure you understand what uh, the, all the terms of the contract are, but particularly the ones related to um, your, that might restrict you from being able to go work somewhere else at the end of your employment um, and, you know, your, your compensation provisions and things of that, you know, you know have a full, full understanding about what your rights and, and obligations are under the agreement and, you know, have a full, um, have an opportunity to talk about, um, you know, those concepts with the uh, person who's offering the contract and, 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 you know, just have a good open discussion about things that, you know, you may be concerning to you. I, Steve, I'll let you. Um, yeah, Ike, on the, on the non-compete issue, one thing I've heard from some <clears throat> young physicians who have asked me to review it, I, I asked them about a non-compete and they say, well, <clears throat> Dr. So-and-so, you know, told me that we all have to have these non-competes in there, but they don't really enforce them. And so it's not that big of a deal for this group. And I laugh and I say, yeah, well, Dr. So-and-so might not be the head of the group when you want to leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's a reason why you're agreeing to these contracts. So I, I know everything seems great right now. And this seems like a great uh, group of physicians to practice with, but you know, we really need to take this seriously. And so for non-competes, there's usually um, language about a radius, you know, how, how far out um, the non-compete extends. Is it five miles, 10 miles from the practice site? It, is it five or 10 miles from every practice site that this clinic has a location? You know, just pay attention to that. If you, if you want to have an out down the road, you know, how far is it that you'd, that you'd have to travel to get another job to to, uh, work somewhere else. So radius is one time period is one, you know, a lot of systems have um, uh, a one year as a minimum. I've seen contracts with two years now asking for two years. So to the extent you can negotiate that great. I've had a lot of questions about enforceability. And, um, you know, it, it is kind of a, a nationwide um, uh, initiative to try and uh, go to state legislatures and make non-compete provisions unenforceable as against physicians and medical providers. And that's hit in some states, but uh, not all states. And so um, it is clearly an enforceable provision in most states that you have to pay attention to. And then the other thing that I've seen recently in a few is they actually have kind of a buyout provision. So they're already thinking ahead to, all right, if you want to um, get out of this and buy yourself out of this non-compete, here's the formula. And it's some sort of uh, percentage of your last year's you know, gross income or something. And so if you are negotiating with a new employer down the road uh, and you say, yeah, I have a non-compete, but it can be bought out for $50,000. And so, you know, maybe you give me a $50,000 signing bonus and I can take care of that. And, you know, so it's kind of nice to have those buyout provisions to have some clarity. Um, and in some markets, you just kind of, if you go to an, a healthcare attorney in a certain market, they'll be able to say, oh, it's going to cost 200000 for you to get out of this. That's kind of the going rate, whatever, you know. And so uh, just understanding kind of what, what the those consequences might be if you want to get out down the road. Steve, you mentioned the enforceability of non-competes and, and how there's this national movement. What is really driving that? Is there one thing you can really put your, put your uh, thumb on the button and say, this is why there's a push for kind of non-compete reform? Well, with the growing scarcity of physicians uh, in the country, you know, uh, each year, it seems like the need for physicians is greater and greater, and we have fewer um, coming into the practice. Uh, that leads a legislature to, to say, hey, we can't have a physician, uh, a productive physician sitting on the sidelines for a year to wait out some non-compete. We need all the physicians we can get right now. And so as a matter of public policy, we're going to declare non-competes unenforceable against medical providers. It's really a response to the feel for that scarcity. And so some states with a greater lack of physicians per capita uh, are more inclined to pass legislation like that. But it's, 
um, really something that's in almost every state legislature uh, all the time. It's just a matter of how much traction it gets. Yeah, or how limited they are. I know in our, our home state of Indiana, um, that's been presented multiple times over the past few years and quietly disappears uh, <laughs> when it comes time to take a vote. So wonder why that happens or wonder who, who's behind that. Um, but yeah, that is, that is interesting because, uh, you know, speaking to attorneys or, or businessmen like myself, um, the cost of switching is very low uh, as far as switching jobs and switching mm-hmm. careers. But it's not like we're going to take a physician who's invested 10, 12 years of their life and say, great, you're now a financial analyst over here for a year. Being a doctor is kind of what you're all about. And so being forced to sit on the sidelines, especially right now in the middle of a, the worst pandemic in a hundred years, it does seem a little counterintuitive, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak. So uh, from my standpoint, kind of rebelling against the healthcare world, you know, I, I am encouraged to hear that, but I know not everybody out there is, but um, you know, there's always, I don't know if you guys read about this, but it was interesting. They did a study uh, a couple of decades ago of why Silicon Valley exploded the way it did from an innovative um, and kind of an entrepreneurial standpoint and compared that with like the research triangle and, and the Boston area. And they found that California, um, actually going to praise California here on their, their forward thinking laws, since they didn't have any non-competes um, ever in any industry, they found that the level of in- innovation uh, skyrocketed compared to other areas. And I'm thinking, well, guys, you know, this has already been done before. Why can't we just you know, do this everywhere and kind of look at actually what, what has succeeded. But if I were King for a day, you know, there's a couple <laughs> things to, <laughs> to change out there. So yeah. do you guys, do you guys ever have an issue with uh, physicians signing a lot of agreements and they don't even read them? <laughs> I mean, a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, either not reading them or not fully, you know, taking the time to, you know, appreciate how, you know, they work on a kind of an on intricate level. Um, you know, so I think, I think we see that, um, you, you, you know, we, we work with some physicians from, you know, time to time and help them, kind of, you know, understand what's in their employment agreements. I mean, I think that there's, you know, key areas that, you need to understand, you know, and, and, and the, the non-competes one of them, mm-hmm. you know, what, what, what are the, you know, the, the termination rights, um, you know, under what, you know, uh, circumstances can you be terminated? You know, a lot of people might sign an employment agreement and say, well, so it, yes, I got a four-year employment agreement, but if you look at it, it, it says, well, the employer can terminate you on 30 days notice without cause at any time. So that's not a four-year agreement. It's a 30 day agreement, you know, technically. Wow. Um, you know, so, you know, something, some things like that uh, are, are really important uh, to, to understand what, what, what are your, you know, just how, how much of a uh, commitment um, do you have from the, the person that's employer employing you. Now, uh, I think hospitals and physician groups will say, you know, yeah, we need the right to terminate you without cause, but, you know, we never really would truly terminate you without cause. There, there's not that that's not in our best interest. Um, that doesn't you know, make any sort of business sense for us. If things are going well, we're going to keep you. But what we want, don't want to have to do is establish the ability to terminate you for cause because that's going to result in litigation mm-hmm. and uh, will be expensive and, and, and difficult. Um, and there is a lot of different, you know, kind of twists and turns on that too, because there's a lot of um, uh, reasons why a physician would not want to be terminated for cause, because if that happens, uh, that's something you often have to disclose on like a uh, medical staff application and things, things of that nature. Right. So there's, there's, there's just a lot of kind of uh, twists and turns, like I said, that go, go into that. But I mean, it, that's a very important topic under employment agreements that you'd want to make sure that people focus in on, um, you know, compensation, uh, you know, what, what are the, what are the, how does the compensation formula actually work? Sometimes it gets really complicated, you know, um, and particularly, you know, as you go, to move maybe some towards some more um, value-based or quality-based um, compensation models. Those might have a lot more discretion built into them than um, do you know a more traditional, just kind of productivity-based compensation formula. So I think you know those those are are obviously you know <laughs> important uh, things to understand. Um, another thing I would say too is just um, practical things about like um, what's my schedule going to be? You know what what um, where am I going to be have to work? You know, because if, if you work for a hospital and it says, 
we can send you anywhere. We have a hospital and that, mean, and that means the entire state of Indiana or wherever else. Well, you know, that might, you know, result in a very different um, sort of practice for a doctor than, than um, they would anticipate if they were thinking, well, I'm going to be working in, you know, this particular location. So I think specificity on location, um, you know, can be an important, you know, thing to, you know, make sure that, you know, is, is reflected in an agreement. So, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, there are, there are, uh, you know, some key areas that I would really counsel physicians to make sure that they understand what they're, what they're uh, signing up for. And, 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 you know, the ones I ran through are the ones that are top of mind for me. Steve, I don't know if you think I missed anything there. Just, just the compensation piece. Um, a new physician will usually have a guarantee for year one and maybe year two. And so that's easy to understand. You know, you're going to get X amount this year and X amount next year. And then you're going to switch to our uh, compensation policy. Well, <laughs> the compensation policy is, you know, yo thick and, um, uh, and it can be changed at any time by the employer. And the only comfort you should get is that, hey, this system is employing, you know, a thousand physicians. So if they change the methodology to make everybody unhappy, then, you know, they're going to lose a lot of physicians. So, you know, there, there is strength in numbers when you're put on some sort of a large compensation uh, plan, but you're right, it gets very complicated. And then and some physicians are concerned that um, there's a certain percentage, like 15% of their compensation looks like it's at risk because it's based on mm -hmm. achievement of quality metrics or customer service or whatever. Well, those are actually usually, you know, good things. You know, th those are ways to get above and beyond your base compensation if you can complete this, this, and this. And so it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have some amount at risk. That's actually was put in there by the larger employers to give the physicians a little bit extra incentive. Yeah, it, it, and usually you hear about those at risk as, well, the doctor doesn't work themselves to death because some of these goals are unattainable up there. And I'm glad you brought up the compensation because from what I've experienced in, in working with some uh, physicians trying to exit the employed system and go back into private practice, they couldn't make heads or tails of it, or a lot of them thought that they were selling a practice. And it always fascinates me when a, when a physician says, well, I'm going to sell my practice to a larger system. And I'm like, well, great. What type of multiple did you get? Did you do revenue or just do your, your bottom line income, your EBITDA? And I said, well, no, I just, I just got a big signing bonus. And I, I, you know, decided to switch out the logo on my white coat. And I'm thinking, well, that's not really a practice <laughs> sale. Like it's, mm -hmm. you're, you're just becoming yeah. an employee somewhere. So it's interesting just how that mm -hmm. vocabulary and kind of like, uh, how that just evolves into meaning something com completely different here. So uh, along those veins, let's, let's kind of switch gears into private practice. Um, when a physician is looking at starting up a private practice, what are the biggest pitfalls that they could potentially run into and I'm looking at somebody who's going to be fee for service as well as somebody who might be in our realm, more of a direct care world realm, excuse me. And you know how those compare and contrast. So, so I'll say um, one experience I've had uh, from some solo practitioners is that. Um, they've gone into business and hired a, so I, in full disclosure, I'm a billing compliance attorney. So I suppose to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but to me, um, you know, they hire some coding and billing company to help them submit the claims with absolutely no oversight and understanding. And maybe they'll pay them a percentage of their revenue. So, you know, it incentivizes the coders to upcode and, 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 and yeah. when an audit comes uh, down the road and, you know, the physician says, well, I don't do the bills, my, this company over here does the bills. Well, you signed them. <laughs> and so you're, you're accountable for those claims. So that's something that I think you, you really need to pay attention to is get a, a legitimate 
a reputable uh, billing uh, and coding company to help you do those or uh, either outsource it or hire a certified coder to actually submit those claims. <clears throat> um, but then the, the enrollments are really uh, challenging to manage, uh, to be enrolled in all of the plans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, uh, there's a, a big initiative right now to prevent surprise uh, medical bills. And that, that's all about, you know, a physician practicing at a hospital that's not participating in a plan that the hospital is participating in. So a patient um, is seen at the hospital and then gets some services from a physician who's not in that plan and bills as an out-of-network provider. And that's a big shock because they have a higher copay and um, higher deductible. So, you know, making sure you stay on top of enrollments is, you know, a huge thing. And it's going to be important in the future as, as part of this initiative to eliminate surprise medical bills. Surprise medical bills are, are an issue. Did, have you guys seen any, any traction or movement or are you involved with some of the new transparency prices, um, pricing schemes and, and mandates that are coming into hospitals? Yeah, I, I never thought they, they would, uh, they would happen. <laughs> you know, I, can't, I, I mean, it, we're, still it not, seemed... we're, we're still not sure that they will happen, right. but it's supposed to happen. <laughs> Right. Uh, I mean, it's hard for me to believe that um, providers are supposed to disclose their negotiated um, prices with different plans publicly. I mean, I thought I thought that information was supposed to be uh, private from an antitrust perspective. Mm -hmm. But so it's it's still hard to believe that some of those uh, pricing transparency initiatives are going to go forward. But, um, you know, nothing stopping it now it seems to be having traction from both sides of the aisle think that this is a good idea so um it's a real struggle i think a lot of providers are really challenged with complying with some of these new uh new programs um and so it's <clears throat> another reason why being in private practice is a, a challenge because <laughs> you don't have all the the support and resources that a larger system would have to comply with some of those things. On the on the transparency side, uh, it's interesting what you just said, Steve. So I mean, it would seem like you know we counsel clients all the time about you know for they're going you know if they're going to sell their practice or they're going to do you know maybe we're looking to do some joint venture or something like that that um, you know payer rates or competitively sensitive and we've got to be very careful about how we disclose those so that um, in the context of transactional due diligence so that we don't violate antitrust rules so if, if there that's a you know if there's legal you know initiatives out there that say they, they, you have to disclose that information I guess there's going to have to be some development on the uh, you know antitrust laws too to permit that so that's, mm -hmm. that's that's pretty fascinating mm -hmm. yeah it's one of those unforeseen kind of uh potential consequences because on the surface of it i mean i'm a huge free market medicine advocate and that's really what we do is hey every client of ours puts their prices up on the uh, up on the website there um so what i'm hearing is that it, it it's almost creating an incentive for area hospitals to further you know potentially price gouge or set even higher prices than what you know they've negotiated with insurance companies am i hearing you correctly <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of aggressive language there, but you know, they're, they're all the United States government is, is uh, infamous for unintended consequences of pretty much any law that gets passed. So. Yeah. I, Steve knows more, but has forgotten more about this than I'll probably ever know. But um, one thing I'd say is that, you know, all ho hospitals have like the charge master list, right? It says, this is how much this costs. But nobody pays that rate right. ever, right? It's 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 you know, they pay, you know, some fraction of that based upon whatever they've negotiated with the various payers, or if it's Medicare, Medicare, and you know, I think what we typically would think is that the only people that ever pay that charge master are like people that don't have insurance, but then the people that don't have insurance basically just don't pay. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe that's oversimplifying it, Steve, but that that's kind of what I've always understood. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there have definitely been steps uh, 
on the hospitals on the provider side to address that issue by you know requiring hospitals to offer an uninsured discount and the gap is not as significant for physicians you know physicians tend to uh, mark up a lot less than hospitals do and so what their charges are usually are more in line with what they're actually getting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, price transparency with the, the little margins in a physician practice is probably going to have less of an impact than in the hospital and the uh, provider uh, areas. Unless a physician is doing something like, um, you know, also has some MRI equipment. And, you know, that's an example of something that's very competitive. And if they actually have to show on their website what what um, they're getting from payers and what you know different um, patients their their coinsurance responsibility is, then <clears throat> a, a physician might not be able to compete with a large radiology practice that's able to get volume and you know make. Uh, <clears throat> you know, have, have a much lower price than what an independent physician might have. It is fascinating. It'll be interesting to see what kind of transpires here in the next couple of weeks. Um, gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break, hear back from some of our podcast sponsors. And then after that, uh, let's dive into the world of what medical practice looks like when you don't do business with insurance. <laughs> Stay tuned after this. All right, sponsorship break. Who's, who's the sponsor? So like uh, HelloFresh? <laughs> uh, we've got we've got actually six six different sponsors. Uh, radio radiology group across the country. Some benefits platforms. Um, some patient advocacy groups. Um, Freedom HealthWorks title uh -huh. sponsor, right? <laughs> you got hey, if you want a sponsorship slot, you know what? <laughs> I, I can send you the paperwork, so not a problem. Yeah. Uh, I, my favorite sponsor is Charmin for the Ron Burgundy podcast. <laughs> oh, wow. I haven't heard that one. Oh, you got to listen to the Ron Burgundy podcast. He's got great Charmin commercials, you know. Is it, is it actually Wolf Ferrell doing it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. All right. All right. You learn something new. You learn something new every day. I'm going to have to check that out because on one, like I like listening to other podcasts because you get a lot of inspiration. It's like, wow, I could, I could, you know, switch up the intro or I should be mm -hmm. talking about this and, and use mm -hmm. it and say this way. And one thing I do need to do, I, I get excited really easily. And so I, I talk really quickly and I'm like, so, yeah, that's okay. That's a, that's a good you, point. That's do you, have your, do you have your ad reads totally locked in basically? You, you, oh, uh, I don't do them. I, I got that one professionally. Uh, we send it out to the guy who does the. Um, oh, really? You don't do the ad reads? Yeah. 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 That yeah. always sounds hard, hard. Like it'd be hard to do. <laughs> like it would make it sound good. Yeah. So I don't do that. Um, and even in our agreement, it says like, Chris does not read these. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I, I, I found some other agreement that we were doing some advertising with. And I'm like, you know what, that's, that's good to put in there. So that nobody is, you know, I'm not like Rush Limbaugh talking about like Sherry's berries or anything, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, um, Sherry's berries. it kind of creates, a, flowers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It kind of creates a little barrier here. So, while we say that they endorse, you know, the podcast, we're not an explicit endorsement of them and that kind of stuff. If, if I'm not yeah. talking about it, but I've interviewed all of our, our sponsors and, you know, good people trying to do some cool stuff. Uh, so that's fun. So good. we splice them in and out everywhere. So we'll get, uh, yeah, we'll get part two here. Um, again, I want to be respectful of you guys time. So, you know, another 15, 20 minutes or so if, if we get talking about it and really yeah. focus on direct care. Um, and Ike, I might, I might talk to you a little bit more about this because I know that you did a lot of that work for us very early on. Um, and Steve, I don't know what your exposure is to the direct care world or your experience with it, but- Steve helped, Steve helped behind the scenes on that too. He, okay. he knows, okay. you know, the process of, you know, uh, you know, I guess, you know, exiting Medicare, you know, pretty yeah. well. And, you know, exiting... I think we can talk- Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I see. and we could talk about like, you know, some of the things that, you know, if, if you're not doing business with the government, then you don't have, um, you know, some of the compliance burden um, that yep. uh, comes with that, right? So, yeah, especially everybody... around like fraud and abuse. Yes, that's perfect. Because everybody is just so afraid of this HIPAA boogeyman. And 
Listen, talk about learn, it. no. Healthcare Americana is a podcast for the 99% of people who get healthcare in America. We're not clinicians or policymakers. We're patients and caregivers, executives and advocates who are fed up with the status quo and have a desire to change it. We produce a weekly podcast that brings listeners backstage at innovative organizations across America that are putting patients first by delivering exceptional care to anyone and everyone. I can talk about it until I'm blue in the face, but they're still terrified of it. And I'm like, okay, all right. So just to hear a little bit about what that actually means, what does HIPAA actually mean? And, 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 and when you, when you opt out, okay. what happens, okay. you know? So, okay. Yep. Welcome back to the second part of our episode here on healthcare Americana. Again, talking with partners, uh, uh, I'm going to re- redo that one. I, can- I cannot remember this law firm, you know. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Welcome back to the second part of our discussion here on Healthcare Americana with Ike Willett and Steve Lokensgard, partners at Fagery, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. Uh, this section is going to really focus in on the direct care world and what happens when a physician enters private practice, but opts out of doing business with a government and opts out of doing business with private insurance and how life could potentially get a little bit better. So Ike, start us off there. When a physician wants to do a direct care practice and says, I'm no longer doing business with CMS, the Centers for, for Medicare and Medicaid, what, what happens from a regulatory standpoint? Well, you know, I, I, your, your life has the potential to um, get s- somewhat less complicated from a healthcare regulatory standpoint. Um, and that's the case on a number of fronts. Um, you, if, if, if someone truly enters into a practice where not only are they not doing business with Medicare or Medicaid, but they're also not taking uh, commercial insurance. They're not, they're not, um, uh, you know, in network with any plans and they're not submitting any, any claims, uh, electronically, um, you know, which is generally the requirement to any health program, uh, or health plan, commercial health plan. Um, then, then, and, and you're, tr- you're truly doing kind of like a cash pay practice. Um, you know, things that, you know, are pretty pervasive in healthcare, uh, um, kind of I mean, suddenly come, become not so applicable or maybe not applicable period to you. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I know that uh, physicians are, you know, often have questions on and uh, are interested in is, is when, when does HIPAA apply to me and what, what you know, what, under what circumstances might it not apply, right? So, um, you know, first of all, HIPAA is the, the, the federal law that uh, applies to the uh, privacy and security of protected health information. Um, protected health information being basically any information that is individually identifiable, such that, you know, you, you could you conceivably identify who the information relates to and it relates to their, their health care condition. Gen- kind of generally, that's the definition. Um, you know, it, it, Anybody who um, does business with um, Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial payers, you know, can generally count on that um, it being the case that they need to comply with HIPAA um, because the way the law is drafted, that it's it's going to it's going to cover them um, as as covered entities, as as healthcare providers, which which are, are considered covered entities under that law. Now, if you totally dis- if you totally opt out of all of that and you're only doing cash pay. Then you know I, I think um, you know the the way the law is drafted, it wouldn't really it wouldn't be uh, applicable to you. Now that's not to say that there's no legal um, you know others are there laws related to uh, privacy and security that you don't have to be um, concerned about though because there are still state laws uh, and the state laws uh, can be um, you know uh, more broad and and more restrictive than than, than HIPAA. They can't be less restrictive but, uh, if they you know in, in terms of you know applying in the same way. But, um, you know, there, there, are, there are state laws that, that uh, you still need to, um, you know, make sure you understand, like, you know, just because I'm doing a, you know, a full, 
you know, cash pay business, does that mean that I, I don't have any state law compliance obligations? And that may be the case or may not be the case depending on the state. But um, if, as it relates specifically to HIPAA, if you're only doing cash pay business, then your, your compliance burden is less and your exposure to, you know, you know potential penalties for, for violations of the law under HIPAA um, you know, uh, you know, maybe, you know, somewhat or completely removed, but there are still, you know, very important reasons why you would want to uh, make sure that you have good practices in place for maintaining privacy and security of, of your patient information, um, because there are other, there are other legal, um, you know, rights of action that's, that people can bring to alleged damages. And, and some of those are based in, in negligence theories, which, you know, are kind of the same as like, you um, um, we call them torts in the law. So, you know, if, if you're um, damaged in some way by somebody, by, by their personal negligence, um, th that, that can result in liability to you. So if a, a doctor is negligent with somebody's medical information, talks about them, you know, to somebody that they shouldn't be talking about, and they're, you know, they, they can, you know, allege some damage based upon that, then there's potential source of legal liability there. Um, so, you know, HIPAA, it, you know, HIPAA can be, you know, complicated, and, um, you know, it requires you to have a compliance program and things like that. So if, you're, if you don't have to comply with HIPAA, you, well, you don't have to do that. But there's still good reasons why you'd want to have good practices in place to make sure that you're maintaining privacy and security of, of your patient's information in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a reasonable way. Right, right. Steve, let me, let me jump in right there because I know that uh, you, you have some comments on that. But I just wanted to make sure that um, kind of summarize and, and, and simplify that, that you know, when you are no longer in government programs, their HIPAA doesn't really apply to you because, uh, I'm sorry, let me say that. When you're no longer in the government programs and you're just charging cash, meaning you're not sending information electronically for reimbursement, HIPAA mm -hmm. in the regulatory aspects that it brings doesn't apply to your practice, yet you still have to be very cognizant of your patient privacy. So don't leave charts out and don't talk about the patient health information at your kids' soccer games or anything along those lines. Steve, is that is that a fair kind of simplification of yeah. um, the very <clears throat> very good answer that that Ike just got uh, just gave us? Yeah, I, I think that um, a, a big initiative for our firm in the last couple of years has been helping uh, a wide variety of clients comply with the California Consumer Protection Act (CCPA), which is uh, also very stringent about how you deal with patient information. So it's a state law that's applicable to folks in that state, whether you're a healthcare provider or not. Um, the, the other thought I had about <clears throat> a, a cash only basis is it, you got to kind of jump out or jump in. You can't, you can't put your foot in the water a little bit and bill a Medicare patient for some services, but not others, because once you're enrolled in Medicare, if you see a Medicare patient, you have a duty to submit a claim mm -hmm. to Medicare for that service, and you have a duty to accept as payment in full the amount that Medicare is going to pay you. So you can't you can't opt out um, on a case by case basis. You got to get out or in. Opting out usually and historically has meant that once you opt out, you can't come back in again for two years. But during the public health emergency, uh, HHS waived that and said, hey, if you've opted out but want to get back in again, um, you know, let us know and we'll activate you immediately. Because <laughs> of the physician shortage, you know, they need physicians to come back uh, as much as possible. Um, so opting out right now, at least, doesn't have the same kind of consequences as it, as it used to. And um, I would say, you know, some practices, it's easier to opt out than others. Some specialties like a fertility doc, um, very few services would ever be covered by Medicare or Medicaid. So typically they opt out, they're not involved in that. Um, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, even, even dentists, you know, it's funny, uh, Medicare doesn't cover dentistry. But um, more and more Medicare Advantage plans are providing dental benefits as a supplemental benefit. So suddenly all these dental, dental providers are saying, how do we play in this Medicare sand? You know, <laughs> what do we have to do? And um, the fact is, uh, it was clarified in the last year that dentist doesn't have to enroll in Medicare. 
they just can't be on the OIG exclusion list or the CMS preclusion list, and they can still participate in the Medicare Advantage plan. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know how many dentists listen to your podcast, Chris, but a, a little nugget for the dentists in the audience. <laughs> I, I love it. Actually, there's a lot of, there are a lot of dentist practices installing membership plans. Um, mm -hmm. People are just used to consuming services that way nowadays. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we credit Netflix for it or, you know, go back to <laughs> the very first Gold's Gym that started charging a monthly fee or whoever it was. I, I yeah. have no idea. But, you mm -hmm. know, I, I don't know if that's that mentality where it's like, okay, rather than, you know, just paying 300 bucks for a dental service, I'm going to stretch this out over a year and go on the, go on the payment plan. Um, it is rising in popularity. Yeah. You know, there so a lot of a lot of primary care physicians who we mostly work with um, starting to get into specialties because they're starting to get squeezed, you know, from from reimbursements and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, a lot of them look at veterinarians and dentists uh, with a lot of jealousy thinking, dang, people are very quick to fork over three thousand dollars for a dog <laughs> surgery, but don't want to pay a dime for their own health. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, the other one is is is. Um orthodontists they they yep. um have almost i mean I, I don't think they think of it as a membership plan but basically you pay is they, they say it's going to be this and you, you can pay us up front or you can pay us 400 bucks a month for whatever you know for whatever long it is mm -hmm. right so i mean that's kind of you know it's it's uh you're you're paying in installments you know and it's all cash basically you know that you don't get a ton of most dental plans don't cover a lot of orthodonture it's a perfect point. And, and a lot of people, and again, you know, with, with the incoming administration, a lot of people are pointing towards, you know, single payer healthcare, Medicare for all, thinking that market forces in healthcare don't exist anymore. But those are great examples of where there is very little government or insurance intrusion. And people are very happy with their braces, I guess, usually, you know, unless you got the headgear that needs cranked down. That's never fun socially. I wish uh, somebody would pay for my daughter's <laughs> braces other than me. Don't there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See that? Well, I think you're going to start a revolution on your own there, right? Um, so going back to the, and, and, and I appreciate the, the HIPAA commentary because that's always just the boogeyman out there is what about HIPAA? Because I don't think a lot of people understand it. They think it's this wide ranging and it affects anybody who ever talks to a doctor and it's just not the case, right? Well, right. I mean, it, it apply. It, it actually applies to a much narrower scope of people than I think a lot of people think about. I mean, even, you know, clients that we, you know, I, I, at least a couple of times a year, I'll get a call from a client that's not even in the healthcare industry at all and doesn't, um, you know, doesn't work, you know, doesn't, doesn't provide services to the healthcare industry and is asking me about, do I have to worry about HIPAA? And, and, and you know, those can be pretty short conversations because we, you know, can explain to them that, well, here's who HIPAA applies to. Okay, HIPAA applies to basically two classes of, of parties, covered entities and business associates. Um, covered entities are healthcare providers who submit electronic claims for reimbursement. And then there's a couple others, a health plan or a healthcare clearinghouse. Those are basically three or three kinds of, of covered entities. And then you've got your, your business associates and business associates are people or companies that provide services to covered entities that require them to use or have access to protect, protected health information for some reason, right? So those are the, those, that's who's covered by HIPAA. If you're not in those categories, you're not covered by it. it it's, it's very simple when you say it that way. It, it's not this overarching, just constant presence when you look at mm -hmm. it from the fundamental uh, yeah. definition of it. So, you know, I, I'm curious, cause you know, that was a real life story. We, we had a prospect call us up and says, I can't do direct care. I can't do my own practice because I'm terrified of HIPAA compliance. And I'm sitting here scratching my head thinking, what do you know that we don't know? Or that, you know, some very, very great healthcare attorneys, experts in the field don't know, you know? And I think there's just a lot of misconceptions about it. So I appreciate you mm -hmm. uh, really shedding some light on yeah. it. I, you know, I mean, what is it about HIPAA compliance that scares people so bad? I mean, to me, I, yeah, I, I guess it's just a, a hard to maybe get comfortable with, you know, complying with a, 
technical set of federal regulations and, and just uncertainty about that. Um, I think one of the bigger things too that is an issue for particular smaller practices is what's the cost of compliance, right? Like, so we've got to pay somebody to, to develop a compliance program for us, a set of policies and procedures. And then, you know, every so often we've got to get a security audit, which means in, in paying somebody thousands of dollars to come in and, um, you know, assess our security, uh, our IT security and our physical security. Um, you know, I get that. If you can, if you, if, if you can avoid having to do that expense, um, you know, that might be attractive. Um, can I, can you know, I still want to be like, as we said earlier, careful about, you know, things, but, um, but yeah. yeah. So I, um, on the issue of compliance more broadly, uh, you may recall, we did a deal a couple of years ago where we were consolidating a couple of physician practice and um, uh, typically you don't have to have a compliance program if you don't participate in Medicare and Medicaid, right? Mm -hmm. The Affordable Care Act said, you know, if you bill anything to Medicare, you have to have a compliance uh, program. Well, this deal that Ike and I worked on a couple of years ago, we were getting funding from JP Morgan to um, invest some, some capital into this practice. And in their loan documents, they had a paragraph that said, within 90 days of receipt of these funds, you will develop and implement an effective compliance program. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it had nothing to do with some government mandate. It was the bankers trying to mitigate risk of this company, you know, wow. going under because of some compliance violation. So you know, to a certain extent, I think some of the things that people are afraid of is just good business risk mitigation practices. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think there's a, there's a fear there that what if federal agents show up at my door and it, nobody wants that, right? Regardless of what type of practice you're in. And I think those are kind of the, yeah. the, uh, the ghost stories that always pass between physicians is one, I got sued by a previous employer, previous hospital came after me for non-compete and two, federal I don't know, Medicare agents came armed with machine guns to look over all my files because, you know, somebody complained. Yeah, well, you know, with, with, with HIPAA, what, what happens is, you know, if most of these issues, uh, you know, get on the government's radar because um, there's some whistleblower, a whistleblower brings it to their attention, right? So, um, you know, somebody thinks that they know some some that there's been some violation of of the law or they think that there has been and so they they call the um you know department of health and human services and if it's hipaa it's the um the office of civil rights within the, the department of health and human services and they say hey these people have violated hipaa and what that leads to generally is you get a call from the the ocr and an investigator wants to ask you some questions right and so you know hopefully you know and those conversations can be, you know, pretty short if you've done what you need to do and, and uh, you can get away, you know, relatively unscathed. Um, but I mean, there are plenty of cases out there where people have been either, you know, intentionally misusing or, you know, uh, uh, protected health information in some ways prohibited by law or, you know, are just very negligent about it. And then, you know, there is the possibility of, of government fines, you know, in that case. Um, yeah. I think we don't, don't also, you don't want to discount the risks associated with, um, private rights of action. You can't, an, an individual can't go and sue somebody for breaking HIPAA or for, for violating HIPAA. There's no private right of action under HIPAA, but there, but there, you know, is the ability to bring like a case based upon some, a negligence theory, like we mentioned earlier. So, um, there's been some big cases, um, that have involved large companies paying significant sums to individuals. Um, because an employee of that company, you know, disclosed that individuals, you know, protected health information in a way that caused them reputational or emotional, you know, damage in some way. And, um, you know, a, a plaintiff's lawyer would you know, love to bring that case and say, you know, this is a, uh, you know, a public disclosure of private facts and, you know, we've got damages and you need to compensate us for us. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that sort of, uh, you know, risk is, is one to, to definitely, you know, you know, take seriously because 
I don't know if it's more likely, but it's at least as likely in my mind to result in a, a legal liability or an infant, you know, financial you know, penalties as, as something coming from the government. Sure. So it's almost like the fear is misplaced. And instead of the government coming in and, and, and raiding your practice, it's more, I need to make sure I'm hiring reputable people that don't steal people's information from the EHR and, you know, blast it out on Facebook or in, in social media there. So, right. And train your, train, train your people, you know, tra yeah. train your people to, to, to make sure that they know what they're doing. I mean, Steve is a expert on, um, on compliance and, you know, when you have a compliance issue, you always have to figure out a way to remediate it. And training is always a big part of that. Isn't that right, Steve? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, I, in, 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 um, as much as I'm enjoying this this uh, this interview, I know you guys are, are some very very busy professionals here. But I wanted to ask, you know, so we talked about the direct care and opting out of Medicare and what that does to HIPAA. Are there any other big time kind of boogeyman laws, such as like a Stark Law, Sunshine Act, any of those? I, I guess the question: How does how do those other regulatory um, matters? How are those impacted by not doing business with the government? Steve, would you like to jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, if you're not billing claims to Medicare, then Stark and the federal anti-kickback statute are irrelevant. Um, but just like we talked about with HIPAA, there are state laws. Um, in my home state of Minnesota, we have a state law in the books that says, regardless of your participation in Medicare or Medicaid, the federal anti-kickback statute applies to you. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, even if you're in private practice and you're not participating in Medicare or Medicaid, you still can't give kickbacks to get patients in the door. Now that statute's never been enforced in Minnesota, <laughs> but we always tell people about it, say it's not necessarily the cure-all to get out of uh, Medicare to survive scrutiny. So, you know, there are state laws that you have to be aware of, but um, in general, at least you know, the federal government shouldn't be involved uh, if you're not billing Medicare or Medicaid. So a good, a good, uh, a good basis is understand what's going on within your state. And mm -hmm. maybe just maybe a, uh, a pharmaceutical rep can leave a pen behind and bring your office lunch <laughs> if you don't do it. <laughs> just maybe. Yeah, you probably, you, you don't have to, if you're not taking Medicare, you don't have to report that. <laughs> there you go for all those uh, pharmaceutical reps out there go tell all your clients about direct care and you can start bringing them sure, yeah, back into make offices sure your, <laughs> make sure your pens are cheap too <laughs> yeah cheap pens i used to collect them as a kid you know i i had these mugs full of of uh pens that that reps would leave at uh my parents practices and you know it was a great oh. little hobby until that <laughs> that that dried up real quickly there so last question for you guys here uh before we adjourn Anything coming down the pike that you're aware of in 2021 from a federal or even, you know, state uh, guidance levels that uh, we should really be aware of in the, the direct care and the physician community? Well, Steve's been all over some recent changes in, in the law that, um, you know, maybe ir irrelevant to, to direct care, but um, maybe worth mentioning nonetheless. Yeah, well, I... I feel like all of the the changes to Stark and anti-kickback law are trying to open up uh, more creativity and uh, innovation in terms of how you help your patients. And so, you know, it's freed up the ability to give um, uh, certain uh, incentives to patients to get them to take their medicine or come in for their preventive service. You know, there's there's more uh, tools in your uh, toolbox now to get patients to facilitate compliance and encourage compliance. But also something that we talked about earlier is the value-based enterprise. And um, there was a there was a commentary in the anti-kickback statute about well, you should have an exception for physicians in private practice who um, you know can't implement a value-based enterprise system and take advantage of some of these rules. And uh, CMS came back and said, well, we don't think that's necessarily the case. We don't think an exception because we think even a solo practitioner can create a value-based enterprise and take advantage of some of these rules. So um, they didn't really buy that. Uh, so it's kind of a head scratcher to figure out how you can do that, but it is possible, I think. And so, but being part of uh, large networks 
um, is just going to continue to be the wave of the future and uh, difficult for solo practitioners who aren't competing in some of those networks and some of those plans. Is it, and I know that I, I said that would be the last question, but you just kind of sparked something. Should, should physicians be worried that in the midst of the pandemic, the agency level from the feds, they changed a lot of things with the stroke of a pen to actually make access and, and make caring for people a little easier. Does it worry you that with another stroke of a pen, things could swing back the other way? Well, that's what I thought about HIPAA, speaking of HIPAA, because, um, you know, HIPAA was passed and finalized uh, before Clinton left office. And then the Bush administration came in and said, we're reopening for comments, <laughs> HIPAA. And they came out with something that was kinder and gentler um, and uh, a little bit more flexible for compliance purposes. But, you know, that stood the test of time for 16 years now. So, I mean, yes, things things can change, but it's a hard it's hard to move that pendulum the other way. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate your time coming on the show to talk with us, Steve Ike. Always uh, always good to talk to you, and, and really do appreciate your insight. And uh, again, thanks for thanks for joining us here on Healthcare Americana. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Best of luck. Talk to you later. Once again, I am your host, Christopher Habig. Thanks again for listening to Healthcare Americana. To catch all of our episodes, visit healthcareamericana.com. And of course, to learn more about direct primary care or direct care, as we like to call it, visit freedomhealthworks.com. Again, thanks for listening. Hi again, everyone. This is Chris. At Healthcare Americana, we're always on the lookout for great stories to tell in the healthcare industry. And we'd like to hear yours. Check out healthcareamericana.com and send us your ideas for episodes or if you'd like to be a guest. Thanks again for listening. Hope you enjoy it.